Now, so far we talked about uh, random variables, both discrete and continuous random variables, but we did not say anything about time dependence, we did not say anything about how these random variables could possibly change with time. From now on, we will look at random variables which change with time, which evolve with time and then you have what is called a random process or a stochastic process. So, this is going to be our next topic. which is concerned, this subject is concerned with the study of uh, random variables with some rule for the evolution of certain probability distributions as a function of time. Okay. Now, the first thing we have to appreciate is that uh, a random process, if you sample this random process at discrete instance of time, you get a time series with values for the random variable drawn from the sample space of this random variable. So, if we for instance say that this random variable could have values x1, x2 dot 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 etcetera, then from this set of values, if you sample this process at various instants of time say t1, t2 and so on, these are the sampling instants. Instants of time or particular values of the time variable, the general technical term is epoch, sampling epochs and this is, uh, these are elements of the sample space of uh, the random variable x, okay. Then one asks for the probability that any of these variables uh, values is attained at any given instant of time, okay. Now we need, this is very cumbersome notation. So, what I will do is to just take the index here and label this value by that index, okay. And for this index, I will call, use the symbol j, k and so on and so forth. When I have too many of them, I will call it j1, j2, etc., etc. So, the question is, what is the probability for a discrete random variable, for instance, what is the probability that uh, at some instant of time t1, the value happens to be some j1 or x sub j1. So, I will call that the one time probability or if it is a continuous random variable, then I use, I will interchangeably use this j1 t1, but I will be careful to indicate the fact that this thing is a continuous variable here. For the moment, of course, let us leave it at discrete Then I have this. I could also ask what is the probability that you have the value x sub j2 at time t2 and the value j1 x sub j1 at time t1. That is a different function, it is a joint probability, it is a different function from this. There are two time arguments here. To keep track of that, let me call this p2 and let me call this p1. Okay. And clearly this can go on. I look at the three time probability, the four time probability and so on. Now to specify this random variable completely, I need to tell you all these probability, joint probabilities. So the first thing we learn is that a stochastic process is described by an infinite hierarchy of probabilities or in the case of continuous variables, probability densities, but it is an infinite hierarchy to start with. Of course, with this uh, formidable problem, there is not much one can do unless you start making certain simplifying assumptions. But there is one thing we can do which is not even an assumption and that is the following. You can always take the n time probability this n time probability can always be written as equal to a probability that you have j n t n given that all these earlier things happened. So, I am assuming here of course that t 1 less than t 2 less than less than t n. 
and I am writing the earliest times to the right and the latest times to the left, that is the standard notation. And this n time probability can be written as the product of a conditional probability and a vertical bar will denote the probability of whatever is on this side given whatever is hap on the right hand side of the bar, that will be my notation. So, we have j n minus 1 t n minus 1 all the way up to j 1 t 1. This is again an n time argument probability, so it is still n, but this however is now a conditional probability, conditional whereas this one is just a joint probability. multiplied by the probability that all these events have occurred that is j n minus 1 t n minus 1 dot dot up to j 1 t 1 and that is a function of n minus 1 variable. So, it is p n minus 1 this and in turn you can take this quantity and write it as a conditional probability of this last event have occurring given that all the other events have occurred and so on. So, finally, you can write it as a product of an n time conditional probability and n minus 1 time, n minus 2 time right up to the single time probability p, p 1 of j 1 comma t 1. Okay. So, that is one simplification one can do right away immediately, but even that is not very helpful because you still have this formidable task of specifying all these conditional probabilities that these things have happened. Okay. And that is where the general theory is, one can proceed further with this and so on, but we are going to restrict ourselves to a very special instance, a very special kind of random process where the memory is a short term memory in a very specific sense. Okay. Now, this implies that the probability that this happens at time t n depends on all that happened earlier on all earlier instance of time. Okay. But this is like saying uh, you have a memory in this process. No? Now, experience tells us with random process of various kinds tells us that in nature very often if you use the right number of variables, if you take a complete set of variables in a very specific sense, then it is short term memory that occurs, never long term memory, no history dependence in a certain specific sense. Just to give you an example, if you look at uh, to give you a sort of trivial example, if you look at uh, Newton's equation for a particle moving in space, this looks like a second order differential equation in time. Okay. So, not only to tell you what, it, uh, so if you want to plot the trajectory of a particle, you have to know not only the position of the particle at a certain instant of time, but also the slope of the trajectory at that instant of time. This is like saying really to specify things completely the fact that uh, the force specifies the acceleration rather than the velocity tells you that you need both the initial velocity and the initial position, you know, which means that dynamics is really happening in a phase space comprising the configuration space of coordinates as well as the velocity components or the momentum components. Right? And once you put it in terms of those extra variables, the full set of variables, then the equations of motion are first order differential equations. So, the initial state any given at any given instant of time will determine once you solve the equations of motion will determine the future state of the system. Right? So, that is an example where the dynamics is really first order in time, so that the future is determined by the initial condition or the present and not how you reach that present in exactly the same way as in quantum mechanics where Schrodinger's equation is a first order differential equation in time for the state vector. So, if you tell me the state vector at an initial instant of time and the Hamiltonian which gives you the rule of evolution, you can predict what the future state of the system is going to be in principle. So, this experience tells us that it may be worthwhile looking at those random processes or stochastic processes where this conditional n time probability is not dependent on the earlier variables other than the one immediately preceding here. So, if this is equal to p n 
now it is no longer P n, but it is P j n T n j n minus 1 T n minus 1 and it is just a 2 time probability. So, it is P 2 if this is equal to this quantity here for all n. So, P 3, P 4, P 5, etcetera, it does not matter. Every one of those things gets truncated to just this here. If that happens, then it is called a Markov process. So, again to repeat a Markov process it says nothing about the form of the probability distributions. It does not say anything about whether it is a Gaussian or whatever those things come later. It says something about the level of memory in the process. Sometimes there are cases where you would like to have this dependent on the preceding two instants of time and then it is called a two step Markov and so on, but I am not going to get into that now. This is our straightforward definition of what a Markov process is. does not always have to happen, but it turns out that if you model physical systems appropriately with the right number of variables almost always you end up with a Markov process. Notable there are notable exceptions we will talk about a few of them, but the fact is that in most cases experience tells you how to model a random process and in general the most common one that you use always is a Markov process. Now, exactly as in the vector example I gave of a particle moving in space, it might so happen that the random variable is not a single random variable, but a set of random variables, coupled random variables. Then it would be a vector process of some kind maybe and then it is a Markov process still in terms of memory, but there would not be a single index here, but you need now several variable in labels here for all the variables. Okay. So, that is possibility we keep in mind. And that is a matter of notation which we can sort out if the occasion arises, but this is what I mean by a Markov process, this thing here. A similar thing for continuous processes instead of probabilities, the same thing is true for densities, okay. And then I will call it a conditional density in this case, but it is a two time conditional density here. As soon as you have this, you immediately see that this joint probability simplifies enormously. So, if you make the Markov assumption, this becomes equal for a Markov process to a product of uh, P, P2s of J R plus 1, T R plus 1 given J R and T r and so product from r equal to 1 to n minus 1 out here. So, the last one is this guy here okay. multiplied by a P 1 of J 1 P 1. So, it at once simplifies. into a product of uh, two time probabilities multiplied by a one time probability P 1. Okay. So, the problem now reduces to specifying these two quantities and once you do that then we have all the information we need for this infinite hierarchy of probabilities. Okay. So, it is a great simplifying assumption the Markov assumption is a very, very, uh, it, it immediately changes the complexion of the whole problem and makes it a much more tractable problem to handle, okay. As you will see this itself includes in it enormous amounts of complexity, but it still makes the problem quite tractable. So, we will focus on such uh, cases here, we will look at many examples of Markov processes. There is another further simplification that can happen and that has to do with the fact that the process that we are talking about may not change statistically speaking as time progresses. In other words, it could be exactly the same process statistically, no statistical properties change as a function of time. Okay. In other words, the randomness is not aging in some sense, there is no systematic drift or anything like that. 
If that happens, that would be the analog of an autonomous dynamical system where you do not have explicit time dependence in the way in the dynamical variables evolve in the dynamical rules. They would be satisfying some, satisfy some kind of differential equations, but then those differential equations do not explicitly involve the time. Okay. So, the analog of that here would be a process where the origin of time does not matter and therefore, this quantity here is a function only of the elapsed time T r plus 1 minus T sub r. Okay. And what would that imply? And that is called a stationary random process. So, stationarity implies statistical properties do not change with time at all. So, it implies that P 2 of uh, say k t given j at time t prime, this quantity is a function of t minus t prime and not of t and t prime separately. Okay. So, you could write this as equal to p 2 of k t minus t prime j 0. In other words, I can shift the origin of time and nothing happens, the probabilities do not change. Okay. And very often I am going to make life easier and write this as P 2 of uh, k t j, where k and j are state labels or they stand for sample space uh, elements. I am going to use this kind of notation all the time, this is t minus t prime. Uh, j. I drop the 0 here, it is understood that it is a function of a difference of time arguments here. Okay. What would it imply also for this quantity P 1 of j comma t? This should be independent of time. So, all time dependence disappears in the one time probability. So, this is equal to P 1 of j. Okay. No t dependence at all. And that together with the Markov assumption here, so for a stationary Markov process, for a stationary Markov process, this thing here implies this is equal to a product from r equal to 1 to n minus 1, p 2 of j r plus 1, t r plus 1 minus t r j r. So, we now just have a two time probability to handle, uh, a one time probability, uh, time dependent probability, conditional probability to handle and an absolute probability here. Okay. So, a stationary Markov process is completely defined if you tell me this quantity as a function of t minus t prime and this quantity. Now, all the models we talk about are going to specify these two quantities. Okay. And if there is no confusion, once we reach that stage, I will often drop this 1 and a 2. The moment there is a time argument and there are these arguments with this bar, I know I am talking about a conditional density or probability and this for a probability itself in this case. Okay. You could put in one more bit of physical. Uh, assumption or a, a physical input and that is the following, although this is not absolutely essential, in general we more need it, but it will so turn out that you could ask what happens to this quantity k t j as t tends to infinity. Okay. Notice I have dropped this 2 here, I mean it is supposed to be there, but I just dropped it for convenience. Uh, what would you expect would happen to this quantity 
this probability, conditional probability as t tends to infinity. Well, you might expect intuitively you might expect that this quantity should tend to something which depends on k, but should not depend on the initial condition j, initial state j. As t becomes very long, memory is lost completely. So, I would kind of expect in the same way I expect autocorrelations to die down and so on and so forth. I expect that this tends to something which depends only on k and therefore, is just the probability k okay. with a 1 here. But this needs to be established, we need to make sure this really happens. Okay. On the other hand, if the system as in the common example of some uh, system in thermodynamic equilibrium for example, I would expect the statistical properties are not changing, then if I choose a particular initial condition and ask what happens conditioned upon that initial state if some variable changes with time and I find well, find some quant some expression for the probability associated with it. I could ask what happens if time elapses, a long time elapses and the system nothing is happening to it statistically, I would expect it would this relation to hold good. For instance, if this were the velocity of a molecule and I start with a particular molecule whose velocity is some given number I specify and then I let it loose among all the other molecules and I ask what is the probability or probability density that it has a certain given velocity a long, long time after I started, I would expect it to just attain the equilibrium density all over again. Okay. So, I would expect it would tend to the Maxwellian distribution on this side, independent of what initial velocity I started with. Okay. Well, that is a physical expectation. If the system has enough junk in it and there are enough influences which are completely independent of each other randomizing the whole pro process, then I would expect this to happen. In technical terms, it's, one says that if a dynamical system has a sufficient degree of what is called mixing, this will be true in general. So, we will take a look at examples when this happens. No? But remember that we have already assumed that it is a stationary process. Okay. If it is not stationary, then of course, this is even this is not true, there is a time argument sitting here and it could well be that the initial state is remembered. Okay. So, this uh, poses an incredible amount of simplification once you have this. The moment you have a property like this, it means the entire process is determined completely by this one time conditional probability because from that you get this the zero time thing and you get all the other joint probabilities as well through this formula here. So, a stationary Markov process with this property here of mixing actually is determined completely by determining this probability density, this probability conditional probability. And then it reduces to a question of writing down equations for this probability in general. Okay. So, the processes we will look at a large number of them will fall into this category and we will write down specific equations for this quantity. If you think a little bit, you realize that any modeling that you do for physical systems of probabilities would be always to write down equations for conditional probabilities or probability densities. You need to know given something then what is the probability of something else happening and so on. You never say something about absolute probabilities itself, it is always conditional probabilities. So, rightly uh, conveniently for us joint probabilities reduce to conditional probabilities. Okay. So, all we need to do is to model these conditional probabilities appropriately and then we are done. Okay. So, it is important to distinguish between several assumptions here, first the Markov assumption has uh, reduced things to one step memory if you like and then the stationarity assumption reduces uh, time arguments in this fashion here. Mm. It is important to remember that it does so for an arbitrary n, no matter how many time arguments you have out here, this conditional probability depends only on the preceding instant of time. Okay. That instant is not specified, it is arbitrary, it's some earlier instant of time and that is it. That is all you need. And then if it is true for every such earlier instant of time, you have a Markov process. Okay. So, in a sense this process is kind of renewing itself at any instant of time, it is forgotten the past and now it looks at what it does next. 
the future. So, it is not surprising that there are going to be renewal equations and so on associated with this sort of process. Okay. For instance, you could ask can I write down an equation for this P? And now let us use symbols like J, K, L, etcetera, because we are not going to deal with these end time probabilities anymore, but essentially just one step memory. So, let us uh, simplify notation and ask uh, what is this likely to be K T J with 0 on this side. Okay. Now, clearly if it is a Markov process which has this property of renewing itself all the time, uh, let us look at a case where uh, J, K, etcetera can take values 1, 2, up to some n. In other words, the sample space is discrete and you have capital N of these possible values. We could of course, subsequently look at cases where n tends to infinity or becomes continuous and so on. Okay. Then this is equal to on this side the probability that you started with j and reached some intermediate state L at some intermediate time t prime. So, on the time axis here is 0 and here is t prime, here is t and then in the remaining time you move from L to k t minus. So, let us write it out properly. P of uh, T prime, you started with J, but reached an intermediate state L and then the probability that you went from that L in the remaining time T minus T prime to the state K. But you could have done so through a variety of paths, all kinds of intermediate states L would have been allowed. So, you have here a summation L equal to 1 to N. So, for a stationary Markov process, this tells you because it is not dependent on any earlier instance, the memory is a one step memory. It says to go the probability of going from an initial state j to a final state k in time t is the probability of going from j to l at some till some intermediate time t prime and then in the remaining time going from l to the final state k, this desired state k. And you must sum over all the intermediate possibilities or paths and that is the summation over L out there. Okay. This is like a chain equation. It has got a technical name, it is called the Chapman It is called the Chapman Kolmogorov equation. It should really be called the Chapman Kolmogorov Bachelier Smolikovsky equation, etcetera. Several people uh, were associated with this equation, but it is popularly called the Chapman Kolmogorov equation in this case. Okay. Now, if these were continuous random variables, then you would have to integrate over this state, the intermediate state L rather than sum over it, but that is just a matter of notation in this case. What do you, what is the first thing that strikes you about this equation? Well, first let me say that this is not restricted to Markov processes. There are other processes which also obey the chain equation, but Markov processes obey it. So, it is not uniquely a property of Markov processes. Yeah. But fixing T prime here. We are not fixing T prime. So, this is true for any T prime any t prime in 0 t. As in for each l the t prime that we choose is the same right. 
yes yes of course yes certainly you must sum over all intermediate states at some intermediate instant of time. So, if you draw a picture, here is the initial state, here is the final state, here are all the possible intermediate states, you are going from propagating from here to there, the here to here in this fashion and there is a time slice here at this point at time t prime. So, you are summing over all those possibilities and adding the probability probabilities appropriately to get this. So, what is it that strikes you about this equation immediately? As a mathematical equation, this is not so tractable as it looks because it is a non-linear equation. This equation here is not linear in this p okay? and therefore, it is a fairly complicated equation. It is not immediately obvious what the solution will be. Okay? Yes. T. Yeah. Is it t plus t prime or t minus t prime? Mm -hmm. Well, the time interval left here is t minus t prime. So, that is all the time available for the system to go from the intermediate state to the final state. So, it is this interval multiplied by that interval. Uh, so, this equation holds for uh, all stationary processes, but they need not be Markov. Is that right? Well, they, it, this chain equation, yes, they are stationary processes, but there is a wider class of processes called renewal processes for which this equation would also hold good. It is called, it is an example of what is called a renewal equation, right. But we are concerned here with Markov processes, okay. So, I am not going to get into the technicality of looking at processes other than that. If time permits, we will talk about such renewal processes later on. When we do uh, Poisson processes and so on, then I will mention what happens if you look at a more general case here. So, this non-linearity makes it intractable in some sense and if it is a continuous variable, then for the probability densities, you have an integral equation because there is an integral on the right hand side which is non-linear and therefore fairly hard to solve. It would be convenient to write this in terms of a linear equation for this P. For this purpose, one introduces the following idea. Does not always work, but when it does, this is what happens. So, one introduces the idea of a transition rate. And the idea is the following. Consider this probability here for extremely small values of t, very close to 0 or this probability uh, for extremely small values of t minus t prime close to 0. So, if you look at p of k delta t j this over here, uh, this is state j at time 0 and the state k at an infinitesimal time delta t. Uh, what would you expect this to be proportional to? If delta t goes to 0, I would expect that it is going to remain at the initial state, I would expect a delta function there, right. But if delta t is infinitesimal, then I would expect that this quantity for all k not equal to j, for all k not equal to j, this must be of the form some delta t multiplied by w k j, where this quantity is a transition probability per unit time that the system jumps from the state j to the jump state k. Okay. I would expect the answer to be proportional to delta t and the constant of proportionality is a per unit time. This is a probability, so this must have dimensions 1 over time. Okay. And this is a transition probability or rate to jump no guarantee that this exists no guarantee at all this exists okay but if it does then it has the physical connotation of a transition rate because when you multiply it by the time interval delta t you get the actual probability conditional probability Okay. 
The same thing could well be true for even a non-stationary process. What would happen in that case if I had a, a T plus delta T here? So if I have a non-stationary process of the form K T plus delta T J at time T, you could still assume that if delta T is sufficiently small and K is not equal to J, this should be proportional to delta T multiplied by a transition probability, but that transition rate would depend on time, right. So the generalization of this idea of a transition rate to a non-stationary process is fairly straightforward. This would again become equal to W of K delta T, uh, K T, well K J and then a T here to show that the transition rate itself could change as a function of time because the statistical properties are changing with time. So the great advantage of having made the stationarity assumption is that the transition rates are independent of time, okay. So this is a very physical thing that we are talking about. Okay. If I make that assumption, then what is the next step? What is going to happen here? Well, the obvious thing to do is to say let us make T minus T prime delta T and then for this quantity put that in, put that expression in and there would be answers, there would be things proportional to delta T. The obvious thing to do is to subtract from this K of T minus delta T at time J from both sides and then divide out through delta t and convert it to a differential equation. So this is what one would do immediately, right. So I leave that to you as an exercise and it is not hard to show that with this assumption, this equation translates to d over dt of p of k t j becomes equal to summation L equal to 1 to n and now we got to be a little careful. P of L T J W of K L L not equal to K aside minus because you subtracted this quantity, you end up with a minus sign here and now let us look at this equation carefully. So the trick is to subtract from this both sides of this equation, subtract the following quantity minus P uh, first set, set T minus T prime equal to delta T and subtract P of K T minus delta T which is T prime by the way, J from both sides and put that in and maneuver, okay, yeah. When we are considering the product of probability, is the yes. Cha chapman Kormadra equation. Yes. We are not considering all possible times. Ah, it is not necessary. Any time will be true, okay. So look at it physically, like the picture I drew. You want to start at t equal to 0 at this point and at time t you want to reach this point at time t. You are starting in this state, ending in this state and you have many routes to go through with different probabilities. And now the statement is the probability to go from here to there, the total probability is the sum of all these individual probabilities such that you go from here to here at some time t prime and then you traverse the rest of the way and it does not matter where you take the time slice, okay. These quantities are mutually exclusive, they are different intermediate states which is the reason you sum over it, okay. So when you sum over this prob these probabilities, what is the meaning of the word and? It means if you have several possibilities, you sum over their probabilities, right, this and this and this and this. If you have or then of course it is a different story, if, sorry if it is and you multiply the probabilities which is what I have done, 
but if you have or, you sum over them and that is what I have done because they are mutually exclusive. This is different from this is different from this. So, it is only at the same instant of time that these are all mutually exclusive possibilities. Okay. So, it is worth pointing this out. It is not an equation in time. It is not an integral in time. There are such renewal equations. We will talk about them subsequently. But this is a summation over intermediate states here at any given instant of time in between. Okay. And therefore, I can choose that interval as I in inter intermediate time as I please. I choose this to be infinitesimal. No, no, that would be over counting. That would be over counting. Yeah. This is the physical way to look at it. Yeah. This is over counting because these parts could intersect and so on. So, you definitely have to do this at one instant of time. So, you add over mutually excluded events. Now, let us look at this equation a little bit. So, this derivation is something I am going to leave to you, it is straightforward enough. But what is the interpretation of this equation? It says the conditional probability from to go from j to k, the rate of change of this probability hmm, has two contributions. One is a gain term out here, where you go from j to L, an intermediate state, multiplied by the probability per unit time that you go from L to the final state desired k. That is the gain term. And this is the loss term exactly like in a rate equation because you have gone from j to k, the state that you want to, but then you jump out of it with this transition rate, with this probability here. So, the input into this is first you do this, then you subtract this and then you use conservation of probability. You use the fact that if you start with P, K, T, J and you sum over all K out here, all K now from 1 to N, what should you get? You should get 1 because you start with a state and the system is not disappeared. It is in one of the states available to it including the initial state itself. So, when you include that, the sum should be equal to 1 for all t. Okay. This is equal to 1 for all t greater than or equal to 0. That is input. That is put in. You need to put that 1 in and that is how you get this minus term appropriately. So, the interpretation is quite clear. The rate of change of this probability, this increases when you have gain and it depletes when you have a loss and this is the precise equation for it. Okay. This is called the master equation. This word is used in many, many contexts, but this is the most common context. What is the great advantage of this master equation? It is a linear equation. The price you pay for it of course is that it becomes a differential equation here in time, a first order differential equation. Okay. But it is a linear equation. The matter is not so simple even now because in general if it is a continuous variable then these would be probability, conditional probability densities and this would be an integral. So, then you have an integral differential equation, linear but an integral differential equation and that is not so simple to solve either. Okay. In fact, we are going to look at that. What will happen in that case is that this side will get converted, there will be an integral here. We can get rid of that integral, but we get, uh, get it converted to a partial differential equation in the variable itself, but it will unfortunately be an infinite order partial differential equation in general, okay. at least formally. And then we look at further cases, sub cases, etc. But at the moment, we are talking about discrete variables, we are discrete sample spaces, then this is what you have as the master equation. Okay. Now, when you do chemical reactions, you write down uh, rate equations for the concentrations of various species, you have precisely the same sort of equation, set of equations. You have things which are uh, 
uh, gain terms and loss terms of this kind. So, this is often called a rate equation or something like that, but in this context these are equations for the conditional probability, probability itself. Okay. So, the next task is to solve this. By the way, what is the initial condition? It is a first order differential equation in time. So, we need an initial condition to solve it. And of course, P of k 0 j equal to delta k j. Given that you are starting in the state j at t equal to 0, of course, at t equal to 0, this becomes delta k j. Okay. Now, in a slightly more general context, you could look at this j is sitting here as a dummy variable, as a sort of spectator throughout. You could write such an equation for the probabilities themselves without putting this j in and then specify an initial distribution of j's. Then the initial condition would not be a delta function, but some appropriate distribution. We will look at those cases as well. But this is the task one has to now uh, attack this quantity here. Okay. Now, let us see what we can do about this. The first thing to do is to notice that if j and k run from 1 to n, these indices run from 1 to n, then this equation has the following structure. Let me write p of uh, 1 t j, um, let, let, me, let me write this, let, let me write this as a column vector p. Um, of t uh, given j. So, let me suppress this j index for a moment because it is a spectator sitting out here. For every j this is true, for each and every j. You have such, such a master equation. So, let me suppress that for a moment and write this p of t to be a column vector which is p of 1 comma t p of 2 comma t to p of n comma t with j's understood on the right hand side after the bar. If I have define a column vector of that kind, then this equation here takes the form d over d t p of t equal to some w p of t. w is a matrix of some kind. And what are the elements of W? W J K is just W J K. This is for J not equal to K. On the other hand, the diagonal elements of this matrix, remember here it is L that is getting summed over. So, in, the, in that sense this term comes out into the summation and this fellow multiplies the sum over L. Okay. So, it is immediately clear with the moment's thought that W k k equal to minus the sum of all the other elements in that column. Okay. So, this is equal to minus summation W L K uh, L not equal to K, L equal to 1 to N L not equal to K. Okay. So, you can rewrite this uh, the set of linear equations in the form of a matrix equation with a certain column vector p which determines all the probabilities that you want, conditional probabilities and then multiplied by uh, on the right hand side you have this square matrix n by n matrix acting on this column vector where this matrix has off diagonal elements which are all the transition probabilities and the diagonal elements are minus the sum of the rest of the elements. Okay. 
it is a very special kind of matrix because it says the sum of the elements of every column of this matrix is 0. Okay. Now what does that tell us immediately about the eigenvalues of this matrix? Well, the determinant is 0 because the sum of each element, each column is 0. So the determinant is 0, right. At the moment the determinant is 0, you know that 0 is an eigenvalue of this matrix, right. So this means that this equation in general, this equation would have an eigenvector, you expect it to have a non-trivial eigenvector such that W on P is 0, hmm? which would imply that D over DT of that P is 0, which would imply that this is a stationary distribution, it does not depend on time at all. Okay. So this is buried in it, this whole thing is buried in it and we will see what happens. Of course there are other eigenvalues as well. Hmm? What is the formal solution to this equation? I have an equation of this kind, what is the formal solution? Well, it depends on the initial condition, right. Now what would the initial condition be? We know that at t equal to 0, this quantity here at t equal to 0 is a delta kj. I have written this equation here, this is the k index and I have suppressed the j index, right. So at t equal to 0, what is p of 0? It is going to have zeros everywhere except at the jth element where you would have 1. So you got to solve this equation with the initial condition that P of 0 equal to 0, 0, etc. till you hit a 1 and then zeros again and this will be the jth, it will be in the jth uh, row. Now given that initial condition, what is the formal solution to this equation? The exponential because this W is independent of time and what is the physical assumption that made W independent of time? Stationarity, stationarity, we assumed it was a stationary process, otherwise it is not true. You still have the formidable task of exponentiating this matrix, but we know in principle what is going to happen. If this matrix has eigenvalues lambda 1, lambda 2 to lambda n, then in general, generically, barring repeated eigenvalues and so on, we are going to have terms on the right hand side which go like e to the lambda 1 t, e to the lambda 2 t and so on. So they are going to be exponentials of the eigenvalue multiplied by time. Uh, uh, real and positive because if they are the probabilities will keep on multiplying. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. This immediately tells you that we know nothing about this matrix. At the moment we know nothing about it. What we know is the following. We know that these elements, these fellows are all positive or maybe 0. There could be some states where there is no transition directly possible from K to L. So this could be 0, right, but certainly not negative. So we have a matrix whose elements are all real, all the off diagonal elements are either positive or 0, no negative elements and all the diagonal elements are negative because they are minus some positive numbers, okay. And the matrix is real, not necessarily symmetric because there is nothing that says Wjk must be Wkj, nothing at all. Hmm? So given that, we still see from this physically we would be very surprised if you got an eigenvalue which has got a positive real part because immediately it would imply that this uh, probability is growing unboundedly with time. Hmm? So you need to be sure that the eigenvalues cannot have positive real parts. They could be complex hmm? but they occur in complex conjugate pairs and once they do that what it would mean is if you have an eigenvalue of the form lambda plus or minus i mu then this would go like e to the lambda t cos or sin mu t. That is what the solution would look like, but we must be sure that this lambda is in fact negative. So we would expect something like this, e to the power minus lambda t where this is positive 
and possibly oscillatory behavior, etc. So this is what we should make sure we have. We should expect. Now, we'd expect that as t becomes infinite, I'd expect the t-dependence there to disappear and things to go to where. Well, once I say that all the eigenvalues have negative real parts, <coughs> all these fellows go to zero, but we know that zero has to be an eigenvalue of this matrix. No? Therefore, there would be some constant which is sitting there and the p of t will tend to that constant which will be the stationary probability. Right? Now this is sort of formalized by a little theorem in matrix analysis called Gershkoran's theorem. I am not sure if you have heard of this but let me explain what this theorem is because it is simple enough. It says if you have a square matrix with various elements an n by n matrix then let us suppose the general element of this matrix is uh, A11, A12, blah, 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 etc., A, N, N. Then it says the eigenvalues of this matrix, whatever be this matrix, in the complex plane, because the eigenvalues are in general complex, hmm, are located in certain circles or disks. Hmm. And these disks are found as follows take A11 and mark it on the complex plane. It could in general be a complex matrix with complex entries, we do not care, we are sitting somewhere here. And then you take the rest of these elements here, add their moduli together and that gives you a positive number, right. And that positive number draw a circle of that radius about this point. So draw a circle, of, whether you choose uh, rows or columns does not matter because the eigenvalues of a matrix are unchanged if you change the matrix to its transpose. So the radius here would be the sums of these moduli. Similarly take the next row, take A22, that is somewhere here and draw a similar circle, etc. These things are called Gershgorin. disks and the statement is all the eigenvalues will lie either in or on these circles, that is all and it is a very simple theorem to prove, you can prove it by elementary means, okay. Now these uh, uh, circles, could, this could be disjoint, there could be another disk here which is disjoint, there could be things which overlap, we do not care. What we do know, there is an extra theorem which says that if any of these disks is disjoint, then you are guaranteed to have at least one eigenvalue there. And this is a completely general theorem. It does not say anything about the nature of the matrix. It does not assume whether it is real elements, complex elements, etc. We do not care. It is still true. Now if you apply this to this W, what is going to happen? In the case of W, we know that all the diagonal elements are negative real numbers. So they are all sitting here or here or here, etc. And in each case, the elements add up. The rest of the elements are minus whatever was the diagonal element, right? So the radius is just this distance. And this fellow here has a thing like this, etc. And all the eigenvalues are in the intersection of these disks, which means no eigenvalue can have a positive real part immediately. And all the eigenvalues other than 0 will have negative real parts and therefore the system will, the probabilities relax towards the equilibrium distribution. So W is called the relaxation matrix okay, in the physical literature. So I stop here now. We take it from this point.